You probably heard the African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with a friend. I heard that for the first time many, many years ago when I was filming a project in Africa, and it made such an impression on me because it relates directly to the team you work with. Certainly, you can work by yourself, and you can do a lot of fast things because you're not depending on other people or waiting on other people. But if you want to do amazing work and have a long track record of doing amazing work, you need to be able to build a great team. We're going to talk today about myths people have and mistakes leaders make when it comes to building those great teams. Building great teams is a lot like an art. You know, a great basketball coach, a football coach who's built a great team, a great executive or leader in the business world, that's not easy to do. In fact, if you've had many jobs over the years like I have and many worked with a lot of clients like I have, you've seen that the vast majority of leaders do not know how to develop great teams. They just simply don't know how to do it. It's very difficult. If anybody could do it, if everybody could do it, sure, it'd be easy, but the truth is building great teams is an art form. And I wanna talk about that today. In fact, I read a study not long ago that the greatest people, the, the single biggest reason people were fired last year from their job was it because they weren't qualified or they were incompetent or they didn't show up or they showed up late. The single biggest reason most people get fired is because they can't get along with other people on the team. They can't get along with other people in the office. And so the art of building a great team is so, so very important. And I want to talk today about real problems. In fact, really the things leaders get wrong when it comes to building great teams, I want to kind of take the negative approach today and, and talk a, a little bit, share about five critical things that I've found that leaders screw up, frankly. They just simply get wrong when it comes to building great teams. So number one, the biggest, five biggest mistakes I see when it comes to building great teams. Number one, we don't understand what teams are for. We don't understand what teams are for. Now listen to this and write it down. Leaders make decisions, teams execute decisions. This is a life motto, folks. Leaders make decisions, teams execute decisions. What I'm saying is certainly teams can brainstorm, teams can come up with ideas, but the truth is at some point, a leader needs to make the decision. You know, in a war scenario, a team can take the hill, but a leader has to decide which hill to take. And so often we get that confused. I worked at an organization one time. I consulted with an organization that uh, the, the leader was afraid to make decisions. I've probably talked about this before on this podcast leaders were afraid to make decisions. The, the leader was afraid to make a decision. And so he created a management team of about 15 men and women, and they would meet for up to eight hours, two or three times a week, just to make the most mundane decisions. It was the most chaotic, inefficient waste of time, money, and effort I've ever seen in my whole life, simply because that leader didn't want to make the decision. I want my team to come together, to come up with ways to execute the decisions those decisions that need to be that need to happen that's what your team is for so think about that stop these long boring meetings even brainstorming I, i'm i'm not crazy about brainstorming if it works for you great however i just think there's a time to shut the door go in your office and develop your own ideas and come up with stuff. Then come together, kick them around together. I just don't like starting to brainstorm with a blank slate. I think it's better when we all come with ideas that we can discuss and talk about. So leaders, don't delegate your authority. Teams are critical, teams are important, but they don't take the place of a leader who has to go on the line and make the tough decisions. Number one, we need to understand that's primarily what teams are for. Number two, another problem we have with teams is we don't fire enough people. We don't fire enough people. We have too much fat on our teams. We have too many people that shouldn't be there who aren't contributing, who aren't, aren't helping us get the ball across the goal line. We don't fire enough people. That's why I love sports. Let me tell you what. In sports, you perform or you sit on the bench. You perform or you sit on the bench. Jack Welch, who was CEO of, of GE when he said this, I think, he said, when you don't fire underperforming members of your team, you're not only hurting the organization, but you're hurting them because you're giving them a false sense of what success is. Think about that. It's not about kicking people to the curb. It's not about just firing them and just dumping them. It's about helping them get plugged into where they can actually contribute. Because obviously they're underperforming in the place they are. And the best thing you could possibly do is get them out of that place. They think they're doing well. They think they're succeeding. So you're not just hurting the company. You're not hurting the organization. You're not just hurting the team. You're hurting them. You're hurting that individual who is failing. 
And I know a lot of, a lot of uh, leaders that will say, well, you know what? Nobody knows that Bob is failing over there. Nobody knows he's not very good at what he does. So I'm just going to let it. And I'm not, it's not worth messing with. Trust me, everybody knows Bob is failing. Everybody knows. And it's creating bitterness. It's creating resentment because Bob is a bottleneck. Bob is blocking people from getting their work done. He's holding people back. He's, he's, other people are having to help him along. They're wasting their time doing that. So again, it's not, you know, Bob is a great guy. Let's find where Bob could excel. Let's find where he could really do great work. Plug him in there. But the immediate thing is get him out. And by the way, we're on this conversation. Stop confusing. And this, if you're a pastor out there or a ministry leader, nonprofit leader, this is really big for you. Stop confusing competence with loyalty. You know, loyalty is great. I want people to be loyal. But so often, and I know in church, I've seen it in so many situations, you know, Brother Bob is, is loyal. He's a wonderful guy. I'm, I'm really hammering on Bob today. But Br Brother Bob is a loyal guy. He's been with us for 15 years. He sings in the choir. He's, he, but he's really terrible at what he does. But that's okay. He's loyal, so let's promote him. Let's give him a raise. That's just so, so incredibly wrong. You're not helping the church. You're not helping the organization. You're not helping the team. Competence and loyalty are two different things. Certainly, we want everybody to be loyal, but I also want them to be good at what they do. I want them to be amazing at what they do. I want them to be competent. So just don't confuse the two. And I, and I know people have problems with firing. Maybe we'll do an episode on how to fire people effectively, but I just believe that we have, in many cases, we have too many people on the team. I had a conversation this morning. A ministry leader called me, a beloved person on, on his staff. He just realized this, 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 it's, it's, it's a guy who's just not performing. He's just not performing for a multitude of reasons. And he wanted to talk to me about what should I do? And I said, you know, you got to remove him from that position. Doesn't mean you have to can him. Doesn't mean you have to, to, to kick him to the curb. Let's help him find a place where he could be more effective. However, we need to get him out of that role. We don't fire enough people. Really take a hard look at your team to make sure that you have the right people on the team and everyone is contributing to the team and doing a brilliant job. And when that happens, let me tell you, you start firing on all cylinders. It's really quite amazing. And if you're on the team, if you're on the team, this is a good reminder to make sure you're contributing and make sure you're worthy of being there. Number three, a big mistake we make when it comes to building teams is we think the open door policy is a good thing. Now, if you don't know what I mean by the open door policy, that's leaders that is so trendy recently that um, leaders open their door so everyone feels like they're responsive. Anybody can walk into my office and talk to me. Anybody can share their problems. Let me tell you, that is so, so wrong. And I'm going to talk about another similar area, which is open office design. That's wrong too. But the truth is, an, oh, I get the idea. I get the idea that you want to be responsive. You want to be open to your employees. However, so many studies have, have shown that when you get interrupted at work, when somebody just walks in your office, it takes 20 to 40 minutes. When they've left, it takes 20 to 40 minutes to get back to the same level of focus you were at before they interrupted you. So leaders, no, 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 no. Don't be open to your team all the time. There's a time to shut the door and actually get to work. Now, we can talk about moral considerations of shutting doors uh, at another time. And, and there's a time I, I think most offices need to have windows, uh, need to certainly have glass doors. We, want, we don't want to create an environment where we can have moral compromise, certainly during this era of the Me Too movement. I think we need to go out of our way to make sure we, we want to be as you know, morally upright as we possibly can. And the way we deal with employees, we want to keep it on the up and up and visible and out there and transparent. But there is a time to shut the door and get to work. So I do think that being open can go way, way overboard. And I know so many leaders that it's just, uh, I was talking to a university president the other day, a president, and he, he said that he tried it. And he said, people just streamed into his office all day long. Now you can go overboard the other direction and have so much security and so many obstacles people have to go through to get to you that you become alienated. I don't agree with that either. However, have office hours like college professors do. Post your office hours when people are free to come in and talk. Make yourself available, but understand you just can't leave that door open all the time. And like I said, in a similar situation, the open office rage, I don't know, you probably remember how big that is, where let's knock down the walls, let's just have giant conference tables or beanbag chairs, and let's just everybody sit out here and let's talk. That's become such a failure. It's become a failure because nobody has privacy anymore. 
Suddenly you're hearing everybody's phone calls. They're hearing your phone calls. You're hearing them tap away on their computer keyboard. Uh, you're hearing all the other conversations in the room. It's the most distracting environment you could possibly have. So be sensitive. You could have, I'm all for having open areas where people can come and meet, uh, come and talk. People come and brainstorm, whatever. But the idea of just having these open offices with people just sitting around is r ridiculous. In fact, I have a friend in New York City who's making a small fortune fixing that problem. There are so many ad agencies and corporations and different companies in New York City that over the years have tried that open office layout, which looks cool. Don't get me wrong. It looks really cool. However, they're discovering that nobody's getting any work done. Everybody's being so distracted, so pulled apart. Um, that they just can't do anything. So this guy's going back in and building offices. He's putting in acoustical paneling. He's trying to do everything he can to make it quieter in these offices. He's building new office walls. And he's living it up. He's making a fortune because the open office is such a failure out there. So just be sensitive to that. Uh, open door policy, being open to employees, having open areas, just be sensitive. There is a time your team actually needs to get to work. Number four. Another big problem is our teams are too big. Our teams are simply too big. I, I get assigned to projects all the time working with clients of ours and we work on different projects and the client wants to have everybody involved. And I understand it's, it's a good intention. He or she wants to have every, hear everybody's voice. Well, maybe we do that at the beginning, just have an open air meeting and hear from everybody. But when it comes to creating teams, committees, uh, working groups, they need to be probably six people or less. Maybe eight people on a really good day, but I'm more along the line somewhere around six people. Here's a problem. When you have more people than that, it just becomes impossible to handle. Conversations will spin off. Two guys at this end of the table start a conversation. Two people at this end of the start a paper uh, table start a conversation because there's so many in the room in the, so many people in the room, somebody feels fine about opening their computer and checking their email or checking their social media. Distractions start. And the more people in a room, the more it just de-evolves into chaos. I love Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com, had a great quote that if you can't feed your team with two large pizzas in the meeting, your team is too big. That's become the iconic leveler of what meeting size should be. If you can't feed your team with two pizzas in a meeting, you've got yourself a team that's just too big. So aim for six to eight people is my advice. You know, there are certain cases where you can go over and there are certain cases where you can um, go under that. But, but I just think that's a much better range for creating a really effective team. And the fifth thing, the final thing about uh, that people get wrong when it comes to building great teams is we have team meetings that are just too long. Now, I've talked about this on other podcasts and other episodes, but um, I, I just feel like too often we make meetings a priority. <clears throat> we don't make outcomes a priority. Uh, now, we know scientifically our circadian rhythm is such that most people after about 40 minutes get bored, they get tired, we start losing them, their focus starts waning. So I always, I mean, I've actually, I, I, I've actually, I mentioned earlier, being in meetings that lasted eight hours. I've been in meetings that people just go on all day long. Let me tell you, I look around the room and people are dying. People are dying. Nobody's concentrating. Nobody's thinking about the subject of that meeting. At least break it up into a bunch of shorter meetings. I mean, shoot for 40 minutes, have a, have a break. Maybe another 40 minutes, have a break. But you just can't subject people to really, really long meetings. It sounds so normal and so logical, and yet time after time after me time, we get sucked into meetings that last forever. And one of the key ways to stop this is stop having refreshments at your meetings. Don't open your meetings with a giant plate of, you know, fruit and chips and stuff in your meeting, bagels, whatever, coffee and bagels. Make people bring the stuff if they want. Don't supply it because A... That means the meeting starts with socializing. If they're going to have bagels, they've got to start. They've got to, let me get the spread and put on it. Find a knife. Now, where's the coffee, by the way? They start talking. So you're 30 minutes down into the meeting before anything has ever really started. So you're not being an ogre if you get rid of the snacks during a meeting. People can live without snacks. I'd rather have a, a short meeting with no snacks than a long, boring meeting with snacks. Aaron Sorkin, who wrote the television series The West Wing, was famous for writing in walking meetings. You probably remember the president would just take a walk down the hall and pick up people. And before long, four, five, six people were walking along the hall with him. And a lot of executives had picked that up and thought, okay, I'll, you know, get a little health 
wor- a little workout in here and, and have meetings and people walk in. I've seen meetings where they would go around the block or they would go across their campus or they would go all over the place. And here's poor women in high heels trying to keep, keep up, men in stiff dress shoes trying to keep up. It's just ridiculous. So walking, I, I like to walk, but I'm only going to do it with one, maybe two people at the most. Uh, so if you have meetings, just be sensitive to meetings. I'm going to tell you, um, you know, there's so much thought out there that people who love meetings shouldn't be involved in scheduling meetings at all. They shouldn't even be involved in your project. Meetings are very strategic. And I'm not against them. There is a time we need to come together and figure out our priorities and what we're doing and what everybody's what page everybody's on. However, meetings have become like some kind of a, an art form at some companies. They assume that we have to have them really long. We have to have snacks. Uh, we have to do all these different things at meetings. And it's just not true. I mean, think about it. The purpose of a meeting is to make sure everybody's on the same page, to get, you know, the information to the right people, to create priorities, maybe to brainstorm, figuring out what the purpose of your meeting should be is your job as a leader. And don't ever do a meeting without an agenda. If your meeting has more than two people in it, write up an agenda first so people know what's going to happen and when they're going to leave. People walking into a meeting need to know exactly what time they're going to walk out and you need to stick to it. Sorry, I didn't mean for this episode to go into a uh, diatribe about meetings, but oh, people abuse it. The man, there's actually a, a meeting calculator online. You can Google it, find the meeting calculator, and, and you, you, you enter the salaries that everybody in the room is making into the calculator, and when the meeting starts, you hit go, and it starts calculating how much that meeting is costing your organization. The longer it goes, the amount of money it's costing. You have to think in those kind of terms too in meetings. I'd rather have people out there doing amazing work than sitting around talking in meetings all day. So anyway, five critical things. Let me go over them real quick. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, 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 run, to go off on a rant, but number one, we forget we don't know what meetings are for. We forget that leaders make decisions, teams execute decisions. Don't use your team to make the decision you as a decisions you as a leader need to be making. That's number one. Number two is we don't fire enough people. And I know that, that sounds harsh, that sounds brutal, but the truth is we need to be more strategic about the people on our team. Understand who's there, what they contribute, what they're bringing to the table. Make sure that everybody, you have a lean, mean fighting team. That's so incredibly important. And again, when you do you know, move people away, fire people, whatever. Don't kick them to the curb. Help them get plugged into a place where they can be successful. That's so important. Number three, we think the open door policy is a good thing. The open door policy, let me tell you, in so many ways is a mistake. Certainly it was a well-intentioned good idea and there should be, you should have office hours. You know, John Maxwell talks about taking a walk through the factory. You know, every leader, he says, should be walking through the factory. Get to know your people on the loading dock, in the front room, in the back room, in the storeroom, wherever. Get to know your team. Get to know your people. However, don't just leave your office door open and allow people to just walk in there, plop down on the sofa anytime they want and just start talking. You need to have some separation just so you can get to work. And I say this about other team members. You're the same way. It's not just about leaders. It's about the designer. It's about the salesperson. It's about the writer. It's about the video person. You need to shut your door and get to work as well. Don't just have an office where people feel free to walk in and interrupt you. Because remember that statistic. Once you're interrupted while you're working, it takes between 20 and 40 minutes after that person walks out before you can get back to that same level of concentration and focus. So the question is, how many of those can happen in a day before your day is completely blown? So don't, don't, don't think about this open door policy being the answer to everything because it's certainly not, or the open office idea. And then finally, don't let your meetings go too long. We think, you know, we make a mistake because we make team meetings too long. You know, focus, make meetings, make meetings a big deal at your organization. Not a big deal in the sense of having a lot of them, but a big deal in we know what their purpose is, we know what their priority is, we know what we're going to accomplish, and we know we're going to walk out. You start having meetings like that, People will want to start coming because that's going to help them find out what's going on and how your company is impacting the world and what they need to know about it and what they're bringing to the table. And they'll be much more of a participant 
and those kind of meetings. Okay, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Remember, philcook.com, P-H-I-L-C-O-O-K-E, my blog. I'd love for you to check it out. Also, remember my unique creative planner. Uh, these are really flying off the shelves. People love these things. I'm getting some amazing reviews about them, helping you refocus your life. And, and those of you who haven't gone back to print in a long time, uh, you know, you're stuck in the computer world. This doesn't take the place of your computer. It works alongside your computer. There's a place for both in your life. This is just going to help you focus and help you accomplish more things in a much higher level. Remember, productivity is not about being busy. It's about doing the right things well. Tune in, share this with your friends. Appreciate you watching it. It means a lot to me uh, that you trust this stuff enough to come and listen and hear what I've got to say. Share it with people you think need it. And uh, keep tuning in, keep subscribing, because that's what's important.